The archetypal medical emergency is a cardiac arrest, and in Australia there are approximately 25,000 deaths each year due to this. In a cardiac arrest, the heart stops beating effectively, so no blood flows to the vital organs, in particular the brain. The brain is so sensitive to the lack of oxygen that approximately four minutes without effective heart function usually leads to hypoxic brain damage and death. Like many of our emergency processes, we've developed evidence-based treatments which have been shown to be most successful in resuscitating a patient. With clinicians and scientists across the world collaborating to agree on best practice. With the pandemic, however, all bets are off as many of our most ingrained and practiced interventions lead to potential infection of clinicians with COVID-19. In the few short months since the first cases were described in China, our cardiac arrest management has changed markedly. In this episode of Inside COVID-19, I talk to the emergency specialist who has been instrumental in adapting the way we work. So first of all, we wanted to demonstrate the processes involved with cardiac arrest management in normal circumstances before the COVID-19 pandemic. The first thing that happens after a call for help is made is that the staff go through the doctor's ABCD algorithm, albeit in a hospital setting. The doctor tries to elicit some response and when the patient is unresponsive, calls for help, opens the airway and performs a look, listen and feel manoeuvre for up to 10 seconds to check for breathing. As we know, the combination of being unresponsive and not breathing normally are the two defining characteristics of cardiac arrest. After diagnosing cardiac arrest, the most important next intervention is immediate high-quality CPR or HQ CPR. Although high-quality CPR is essential, delivering oxygenated blood to the myocardium in the brain, it will not by itself reverse the cardiac arrest in adults. Many cardiac arrests result from an acute coronary syndrome or some other pathology that causes a cardiac rhythm that doesn't support life, often a shockable rhythm that can be reverted with defibrillation. The vital next step, therefore, is to apply the pads of a defibrillator, check the rhythm and deliver a rapid shock in an attempt to regain normal heart function and a cardiac output which will perfuse the brain. The team leader arrives and takes over and requests an immediate rhythm check. This takes place according to the coached mnemonic. COACH stands for continue compressions, oxygen away, all others stand clear, charging. Then when the defibrillator is charged, hands off, evaluate the rhythm and defibrillate or dump. After an unsuccessful initial attempt at resuscitation, CPR is immediately restarted to perfuse the brain, whilst interventions are made in an effort to deal with any reversible causes, usually referred to by the four H's and four T's. After every 30 compressions, the person performing high quality CPR turns to the bag valve mask being held by a colleague and squeezes the bag twice, delivering two breaths. This 30 to 2 compression ventilation ratio continues throughout the cardiac arrest. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the risk of infection for all staff has been an increasing concern. And as we'll hear later, aerosol generating procedures such as cardiac arrest management, particularly aspects such as CPR and airway management, are particularly high risk procedures. The first thing to note is that all clinicians in this environment are wearing personal protective equipment, or PPE, with gloves and surgical masks at a minimum. One of the first major differences is that in a cardiac arrest in a possible COVID-19 patient, the staff consider the danger of aerosol transmission. When assessing the patient for response, the oxygen mask is kept on, and when breathing is assessed, the doctor does not bend down and put her face next to the patient's mouth and nose to perform the look, listen and feel manoeuvre, but instead looks for respiratory effort and function for a maximum of 10 seconds, whilst using a hand on the patient's chest and upper abdomen to try to palpate respiratory movement. When there is none, they start immediate high-quality CPR. 
To further protect themselves from any potential aerosols, the staff then place a towel over the face of the patient. The cardiac arrest team has been called. Although the management of a cardiac arrest patient has as much urgency as ever, it is essential to protect all staff from infection in this high-risk situation. Whilst the ward staff continue high-quality CPR, the cardiac arrest team are donning aerosol PPE, which comprises gowns, N95 masks, gloves and eye protection. The cardiac arrest team takes over the CPR, at which time the ward staff leave the area. The team leader takes over running the cardiac arrest management and is very clear in explaining the aspects that have changed. It's essential that instructions are clear and concise and that there is a check to ensure that team members have understood, leaving no room for misunderstanding. From this point onward, cardiac arrest management continues as before, incorporating a rhythm check and defibrillation. However, to maximise the chances of defibrillation, whilst minimising risk to staff, teams have reverted to using three stacked shocks. Although in prior practice this had been discontinued as the need for more high-quality CPR between shocks to ensure brain and myocardial perfusion was seen to be most important, we now see the stacked shocks as the best compromise between effective treatment and staff safety. At the end of the three stack shock cycle, high quality CPR resumes. The airway operator now signals to the team leader that his team is prepared to intubate at the next rhythm check. Once again, due to the risk of aerosol spread of coronavirus, early intubation is now seen to be essential and this is planned well in advance and strictly controlled and choreographed. Closed loop communication ensures that the team understand what is planned and what their role is in the next stage of management. So after the, the shocks have been delivered, we're going to intubate patient. At that stage, no chest compressions, please. Once the tube is in and the cuff is up, I'll instruct you that you can do compressions again. Is everybody clear? Clear. Yeah. Okay, continue with compressions. Oxygen away. All others away, we're all clear. Shockable rhythm, we're charging. Hands off. Okay, we're shocking. Shockable rhythm. Okay, continue on with the shockable rhythm. Okay. Continuing, we're charging, top, middle, bottom, everyone clear, shocking, Until, continue, so, All of the processes in the intubation are clearly described to ensure that communication is optimised. Although this scenario is demonstrated using direct laryngoscopy, Using a video laryngoscope would be more preferable due to decreased proximity to the patient's airway. Even when video laryngoscopy is used, the same safe steps are utilised. From this point onwards, oxygen is being supplied through a closed circuit, so defibrillation can be accomplished without removing the oxygen from the patient. If defibrillation is successful and the patient is transferred to a ventilator, the endotracheal tube is routinely and transiently clamped while the transfer occurs. Compressions can now continue. Thanks for making the time today, Jimmy. Um, I wonder if you could do me a favour, maybe just introduce yourself for everybody watching. Sure. So, uh, Jimmy Bliss is my name. I'm an emergency and retrieval physician, and I've been involved in writing several policies regarding cardiac arrest management during the COVID pandemic. Fantastic. Okay. So, the point of today really is to, just to chat about some of the changes uh, in the way we do cardiac arrest since COVID-19, and uh, you know the principles behind it, why we're changing, and, and essentially what that's resulted in. Yeah, okay. So 
the first thing really is I wanted to ask you just about the principles that have driven the changes in the way we manage cardiac arrests. You know, what are the underlying sort of concerns that have made us do things differently? Mm. So I guess this all began certainly with our thinking here in late February, early March of this year, mm. um, when cases of COVID-19, both in Australia and around the world, were escalating very rapidly. Mm. And we anticipated a world where we would be seeing large numbers of patients with presumed or or confirmed COVID-19 in our emergency departments, but also that we'd see community transmission to an extent that we would also see COVID-19 as a coexisting illness in people presenting with other conditions. And this, there was a lot of concern and a lot of angst amongst our staff, and rightly so. It's a new novel virus, it's highly contagious, mm -hmm. it has a relatively high mortality rate, and there is no convincingly proven treatment or vaccine. So the key is protecting our staff. So there was a huge amount of concern that our staff in performing their daily duties risked contracting this virus. And the particular concern was related to what's called aerosol generating procedures. So the virus is fed by droplet or airborne spread following an aerosol generating procedure. Mm. And our standard cardiac arrest management contains a number of these procedures. Uh, these include bag valve mask ventilation, um, tracheal intubation. And whilst there is some debate in the literature, certainly plausibility that both chest compressions and defibrillation could be um, aerosol generating procedures. Yeah, yeah, okay. So. Um Obviously, what we're trying to do, as you say, is to ensure that all clinicians are protected when they do this, do this sort of these various procedures in cardiac arrest. But um, you know, there are a number of principles that we've had underpinning, you know, the evidence underpinning cardiac arrest through uh, ILCOR, you know, the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, the Australian Resuscitation Council, which seem as if we're moving slightly away from them. You know, things like say, um, you know, an uh, open airway, rapid, immediate, high quality CPR, you know, early defibrillation. You know, are these just as important now as they were before or are we doing something slightly different? They absolutely are. And I think it's a, it's a difficult balance when you have these procedures and you have this illness, then there is a balance between wanting to provide the immediate interventions for our patients that we know from decades of research. Uh, are beneficial to them, but not wanting to unnecessarily expose our staff to risk. So I, I kind of look at this in, in three ways. So the first way that comes before any of this management, it's uh, avoiding unnecessary resuscitative procedures on patients in who they're futile or they're not in keeping with their previously expressed interests. So preventing those resuscitations from taking place in the first place. Which is quite difficult, of course, because we were very primed to, you know, jump in and save everybody. It, it is very difficult, but it, it can be achieved by having appropriate discussions of ceilings or of, of care intervention at the time of hospital admission. Mm. The second layer I see is making sure that our staff have appropriate access to the right type of PPE for aerosol generating procedures, mm -hmm. so that if they're going to be performing these procedures, that they are appropriately protected. So that's eye protection, gloves, gown, and an N95 mask. Making sure that these procedures are, um, are making sure these procedures occur in the right location. Mm -hmm. And then beyond those, there are the, some modifications to what we would consider the more standard cardiac arrest management. Mm -hmm. So for an example, here we have chosen to prioritize the insertion of an endotracheal tube so bag valve mask ventilation is an aerosol generating procedure. Ventilation through an LMA, an insertion one, is an aerosol generating procedure. Placing a tracheal tube is an aerosol generating procedure, but it's performed by the most senior person and it's performed quickly and after its insertion, you have a closed system with a viral filter in situ. Therefore, that provides one, um, a method of oxygenation for your patient and it also provides a layer of safety for your staff. So we are prioritizing the intervention that whilst we're still treating the patient, provides the maximum level of safety for the patient, uh, for, the, for the staff as well. Other things that you may have noticed that are aimed at reducing um, potential aerosolization or spread to the staff are the covering of the face. Mm -hmm. So the patient has a, 
a Hudson mask with a towel over the face until there is an attempt at um, an insertion of an endotracheal tube and we have removed those other means of oxygenation and ventilation where we felt that the risk to staff was high in lieu of a safer alternative. Okay. Um, and I think when we are doing any, way, any sort of airway manipulation or any potential airway uh, aerosol generating procedure, we're also doing things like turning off oxygen, aren't we, I think, and clamping a tube potentially, this sort of thing. That's true. So we are turning off the oxygen for defibrillation. We're turning off the oxygen before removing the mask from the face. Mm -hmm. And you're right, the closed circuit is closed whilst it's closed, but for any circuit disconnects, there needs to be meticulous attention to, um, to circuit disconnects, which includes clamping and disconnecting uh, more proximal, so away from the patient, from the viral filter, again, to reduce risk to staff. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting as well, isn't it, that, you know, for, um, for some time we've been saying that the most important thing, you know, is, is uh, chest compressions, you know, they have primacy uh, with an open airway or potentially with, you know, a bag valve mask being held on with, uh, you know, two-handed grip, that sort of stuff. But we really are only leaving that for right at the start of a procedure and really trying to do without the bag valve mask entirely, I think, aren't we? At this stage we are. Different institutions have had slight variations on this, including holding a mask tightly against the face uh, or insertion of an LMA. Mm. But our feeling here was that we would just prioritize one intervention that we can perform quickly and safely and leave allow there to be sort of less area that's open to interpretation. Find us up, particularly with everything else that's going on, if things can be done in, in a standard in one way that has less variation, it's yeah. more, I would say, probably more easy to remember. And yeah, well, of course, you know, you know, emergency, critical care, you know, anything that's urgent and undifferentiated, then, of course, the principle is to try to keep things as standard as possible and yeah. leave as little room for variability in care as, as we can, really. Yeah. And I think above and beyond all of this, it's important to say at, at no stage are we de-emphasizing any of the things that we know to be important. Mm -hmm. Early high quality CPR, mm -hmm. early defibrillation for shockable rhythms are key to cardiac arrest management before COVID and they're absolutely key to cardiac arrest management here. Mm -hmm. It's just making sure that the whole process is done safely. Okay, um, that's, uh, that's uh, perfect really, because what I wanted to talk about next is actually defibrillation. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're now, going back to something which had had a very limited role previous to COVID, which is the three stack shocks yeah. as well. I wonder if you might want to just chat about that for a moment. Sure. Um, defibrillation is, is an interesting point. It's classed by some bodies as an aerosol generating procedure, but other bodies don't classify it as such. Mm. Um, there is plausibility that the electricity can cause chest wall muscle spasm and you have potential to create aerosols, mm. but like all, all of this decision making regarding cardiac arrest with COVID, it's based on limited poor quality evidence. A lot of this is, is consensus opinion based on small number observational studies and some lab studies. Um, so, that, so there's plausibility that defibrillation may be a source of aerosol generation. When we think about um, cardiac arrest in COVID, what are we going to see? And largely we thought, well, we're going to see people with progressive respiratory failure due to COVID pneumonia, mm -hmm. ARDS. We're going to see potentially a small number of patients with COVID-related myocarditis mm -hmm. who might have dysrhythmias, but they're going to probably present late and be less of a common presentation to the emergency. 10 sort of syndrome, maybe, yeah. And then we're going to see all of those people that are going to have cardiac arrest for all of the reasons they had cardiac arrest before this began with or without co-infection yeah. with COVID. And you really don't want to um, deny those patients the right treatment. So there has been quite a broad sort of uptake on this idea of, of three stack shocks for uh, shockable rhythms in the, in the sort of spectra of aerosol generating procedures, defibrillation would be considered definitely on the, the sort of safer end from a staff safety point of view mm. over and above many of the other interventions. 
hence it's prioritised. Um, and I suppose the other thing that's been occurring to me is that, you know, if, you, if you're talking about a cardiac arrest on a ward, so an, in, an in-hospital cardiac arrest, mm -hmm. then at least you've got that prior information, you're fairly sure that somebody is COVID positive or not. Mm -hmm. So, um, but of course, we're still making the assumption there's a risk to staff, so we're going to still carry on with PPE, etc. Uh, in the pre-hospital and emergency setting, of course, it's, uh, you know, far more tenuous level of knowledge. And, uh, you know, it seems like we have to treat everybody as potentially COVID positive. Mm -hmm. Um, we felt when we developed guidelines locally that there would certainly be a tipping point where we treated everybody in the same fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a point where community spread of COVID had reached a certain level. Mm -hmm. um, what we decided to do locally was involve a, a risk assessment at the point of presentation mm -hmm. um, to decide whether they were treated along the COVID style cardiac arrest lines or whether they were treated standard care. Um, now, we never really reached that tipping point where we felt we needed to treat all patients the same. So what we would do is that on bat phone notification of a cardiac arrest, we would try and ask a few closed questions to make an initial risk assessment. Mm -hmm. If we had available de patient demographics, then we'd interrogate the local EMR to see if they had been COVID tested mm -hmm. or looking for other comorbidities. And then what would happen was that the most senior um, emergency doctor, so typically the face, would go in full aerosol generating PPE to the ambulance bell, the ambulance to receive handover there, and then sort of make two really important decisions. Um, so the first on the basis of the patient's known comorbidities, any known expressed wishes, and their rhythm and the history of resuscitation, low and no flow states and response to treatment, make a decision whether there was um, a requirement to continue resuscitation or whether at this point it looked like this resuscitation would be futile and they make a decision to pronounce life extinct and receive resuscitation at that point. Mm. But the second was to make a, a risk assessment as to whether they were high risk or low risk COVID. And that was based upon either you know, that they were a known case or at that time based on the New South Wales Health case definition for COVID. So if they met the case definition for testing, then they would be treated as high risk. Mm -hmm. Whereas if they did not had a clear alternate suspected cause for cardiac arrest, they would be managed along usual lines. Mm -hmm. But that, that process would have changed had community spread become more prevalent and still might do depending on how community spread. Mm, absolutely. So my last question, I suppose, is, um, you know, we, we teach basic life support, advanced life support. We simulate, we practice, we practice, we practice to try to get, you know, muscle memory involved, to try to get a, uh, you know, a, a replicate a cognitive approach that always is the same so we don't have any changes. Mm -hmm. Suddenly changing everything we do to a whole new set of, of uh, ways of doing things mm -hmm is clearly quite a challenge in terms of training of staff. Yeah. And then, of course, if we move to the point where we risk assess and we might do it one way or we might do it the other way, mm -hmm. and that makes it even more of a challenge. Uh, you know, what's your experience been in terms of training? Uh, I agree. It's, it's very hard. This was a real a, a shift from something we're so used to doing one way. Even, even small changes are very difficult when you've been trained in such a way. So how we approached it was that we basically conducted daily in situ sims of this and basically two scenarios, the, the cardiac arrest in our respiratory assessment area where patients with uh, suspected COVID were assessed. Mm. So a cardiac arrest there or a pre-hospital notification of a cardiac arrest in a patient who met case definition as well. And we, we sim these in situ in the usual spaces uh, until those procedures became as second nature is the ones we always had or, or had before. Mm -hmm. So it, it was striking how challenging it was initially to, um, to, to try and drill these new processes, but mm -hmm. just by doing and doing in the same space you're working in every day. Mm -hmm.